question. Well, then why did he choose him? Why would he put a crook in the ministry? Why would he want a dirty double crosser to represent him? Who would want a man like this on his team? Well, that's a good question. I think it's got a good answer. And I think that you're going to find today, like all of the Scripture, that you're going to find in the answer a word of warning, a word of assurance, and you're going to find a word of comfort. Profound Truth Simply Stated. This is Love Worth Finding with pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers. And now let's turn to the Word of God. Would you open your Bibles to John chapter 6? And in a moment, we're going to begin reading in verse 71. And as you're turning to that, let me ask you a question. Don't lift your hand, but just answer in your heart. How many of you know a man or a boy named John? Or how many of you know a man named James? Or a boy named Matthew? Or one perhaps named Philip? Or maybe someone named Andrew. Or maybe someone named Paul. I think most of us would say, yes, I know somebody with all of those names. I want to ask you another question. How many of you know a man or a boy named Judas? Probably not a one. <laughs> you might know a goat named Judas, maybe a dog named Judas, but you don't know a boy or a man named Judas. And if you do, it would be a very rare name. But once there was a mother who held a little baby boy in her arms and kissed that baby face and called her little baby Judas. And she loved him with all of her heart. But now the name Judas is a name of infamy. It's a name of disgrace. It's the name of treachery. And yet, Jesus chose Judas. Look with me now in verse 63. Jesus said, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. Now that's a key, underscore that. But there's some of you, he's talking to his disciples, there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. And from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Literally, the word is a demon. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. He was one of the twelve disciples. Jesus chose him. Now, the scene is the Garden of Gethsemane. The night is dark. Jesus is praying till the sweat is on that blessed brow like drops of blood. He is in anguish. His disciples are asleep. They could not watch and pray with him. And suddenly there's a sound, muffled voices, clanking armor, shuffling footsteps, lighted torches. That secret prayer place now is just filled with people. The priests are there. Their eyes are burning with hatred and anger. 
And from that crowd there steps a man. His name is Judas. He has a sickening grin on his face, but he cannot hide the treachery in his eyes. He steps forward and he plants a kiss on the altogether lovely and pure cheek of Jesus and he hisses out in hypocrisy, Greetings, Master. As the King James says, Hail, Master. And that kiss must have burned like a coal from hell. It was the kiss of betrayal. It was the kiss of death. Now how did all of this happen? Did all of this take Jesus by surprise? I mean, after all, Jesus chose this man. <laughs> Was Jesus a bad judge of character? Did Jesus make a mistake? Friend, he never made one mistake. The Bible says he doeth all things well. He knew exactly, precisely what he was doing when he chose Judas. Question, well, then why did he choose him? Why would he put a crook in the ministry? Why would he want a dirty double crosser to represent him? Who would want a man like this on his team with eyes wide open knowing that he would be betrayed? Well, that's a good question. I think it's got a good answer. And I think that you're going to find today, like all of the Scripture, that you're going to find in the answer a word of warning. You're going to find in the answer a word of assurance. And you're going to find a word of comfort. As we look into this passage and we ask ourselves and we look at related passages and we ask ourselves, oh, why did Jesus choose Judas? Here's the first thing, the four thoughts today. The very first thing I want you to see is a lesson concerning religious hypocrisy. Religious hypocrisy and the need of true salvation. Now look, if you will, in verse 64. Jesus said, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. By the way, as he looks at this congregation today, he knows who the true believers are. He knows the difference. There are some who are sitting here today. You're going through the motions. You look just like everybody else. But there's a line that divides people today. Those who believe and those who believe not. Now, he's not talking about intellectual belief. The word belief here means heart trust. Jesus knew who trusted him, and Jesus knew who did not trust him. Well, if you don't trust him, you're not saved. For the Bible says in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now listen very carefully, because this is the word of warning. Because there are many today who are in, in exactly the same crowd that Judas was in. You see, Judas had the right stuff. I mean, Judas had the right stuff. If you looked at Judas, you would have said, What a great guy. This man, Judas, is. For example, he had the right associations. Didn't he rub shoulders with the other 11? I mean, that's pretty good company, isn't it? <laughs> he was an intimate with Jesus. Jesus called him friend. He spent three and a half years in the best seminary in the world <laughs> studying with the Lord Jesus Christ, learning facts, hearing Jesus Christ talk. What, 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 a, uh, what association this man had. And I tell you, not only did he have the right association, he had the right reputation. Now, when, when uh, Jesus was at that Last Supper and he said, one of you is going to betray me, the people didn't say, oh, I know who it is. It must be Judas. Truth of the matter is, if they thought it was anybody, they probably thought it was Peter. Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. They, they, is it I? Am I the one that's going to do that, Lord? Let me tell you how much they trusted Judas. Do you know what job Judas had? 
Judas was the treasurer. Judas was the treasurer of that little group. The Bible says he held the bag. He was, he was the man that had the money bag. Now, who do you make treasurer? The person who has the most integrity outward, the person that you respect the most. I'm saying he had the right association. <laughs> he had the right uh, reputation. And uh, I'll tell you something else. He had the right participation. He was a worker. <laughs> he went out with the others when they went out to teach and to preach and to do good. He was right in the group. Got a lot of folks like that in church this morning. Uh, you're in a Bible-believing church. Uh, you've got good association. You've got good reputation. Everybody thinks you're a wonderful person, and you may be outwardly. Uh, <laughs> You, you are doing a lot of good things. You may be singing in the choir this morning. You may be taking the offering this morning. You may be teaching a Sunday school class this morning. You may be doing something wonderful, but Jesus said, many will say unto me, this is Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never, knew you. Now that ought to be a warning. I want you to listen very carefully. The devil had rather send you to hell from the pew than he had from the gutter. Many people trudge to church on Sundays who have never been born again. Nobody suspected Judas. Judas, are you saved? I'm a church member. I didn't ask you that, Judas. Are you saved? I am a member of the best church, the one Jesus founded. Didn't ask you that, Judas. Are you saved? I'm a charter member. Didn't ask you that, Judas. Are you saved? I'm the treasurer. You can go to hell surrounded by receipts for church offerings, baptismal certificates, and Sunday school pins, my friend. Listen to me. What a warning this is. So many people have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And that's the reason the Bible says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Don't think because you're religious that you're going to heaven. It was a religious crowd that crucified Jesus. What a warning that ought to be to all of us. But I'll tell you something else. Not only is it a warning, it is an encouragement. Now, how could that be an encouragement? I'll tell you how it's an encouragement because the other 11 did not quit serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't you let some Judas send you to hell. Don't you let some hypocrite keep you from loving and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So many churches today have become glorified country clubs, and they have their social programs, but they're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and all they're doing is making the world a better place to go to hell from. Environment is not enough. Jesus gave Judas a wonderful environment. Man got in trouble in the Garden of Eden. If you're enjoying this message from Adrian Rogers and would like to dig a little deeper into today's topic, we'd love to send you this free companion Bible study. Use the link above to request yours. Now here's the second thing I want you to learn. Not only a lesson concerning religious hypocrisy and the need of salvation, but there's a lesson concerning divine sovereignty and the, real, and, and the reliability of Scripture. Divine sovereignty. Now look, if you will, in verse 64. You're in John chapter 6 and verse 64. There are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. Now, go over to John chapter 13. Just turn a few pages there and look with me in verse 18. Jesus now is speaking of one who needed to be saved. And he said, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen. Now watch this. But that the Scripture may be fulfilled. Don't miss that. 
that the Scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now Jesus there is quoting Psalm 41 verse 9. He that hath eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now watch this. Now I tell you before it come, that when it co is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Whom? The Messiah. <laughs> Jesus said, look, I have chosen you. I know whom I've chosen. I know there's one who doesn't believe. He's a demon. But he said long ago in the Scripture, the Scripture said that this would happen. This is not an accident. This is not as though something has gone wrong. Divine sovereignty has seen through the ages this would take place. And he says this is being done, that the Bible, the Scripture, will be fulfilled. And he said, when you see it, then you can know that I'm the Messiah. Did you know that Judas preached a wonderful message that Jesus is the Messiah? <laughs> this, this ungodly rascal. Uh, that You see, where man rules, God overrules. Did Judas have a choice? Of course he did. Was Judas forced to betray Jesus? Of course not. God, God gave him a choice. He wanted him saved. Jesus loved him. Jesus would have forgiven him. Jesus would have saved him. Then you say, if that is true, then how, does, how was it prophesied? <laughs> how was it prophesied what he would do? That means he didn't have a chance. Oh, yes, he had a chance. Of course he did. Do you think God would have crippled him and then blamed him for limping? No. Here's the thing, dear friend. Where man rules, God overrules. What we see one point at a time, God sees all at one time. Did you know there's one thing God can't do, and that's learn anything? Think about it. God can't learn anything. How could God learn anything? He knows everything. How can you be omniscient and learn anything? God knew exactly, precisely what Judas would do before Judas did it. Did Judas have a choice? Absolutely. Did God know it? Yes. Did God know it before time? Yes. Did God overrule it? Yes. Is God still in charge? Yes. It's an amazing thing. Human responsibility and divine sovereignty. You and I dwell in time. God dwells in eternity. The past, the present, and the future are all alike to him. Now, there's a word of warning. Watch religious hypocrisy. There is a word of assurance. Nothing is out of control. Nothing. Nothing. God knows exactly, precisely everything that will happen. And I'm going to tell you, friend, we're on the winning side. Jesus shall reign where the sun doth his successive journeys run. His kingdom spread from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. Third lesson I want us to learn. Not only the lesson of divine sovereignty and the reliability of Scripture, but personal responsibility and the tragedy of sin. We've already said Judas was responsible for what he did. He was not a machine. He was not forced to do this. The Bible tells us clearly that Judas was a thief. Go back to John chapter 6 and look, if you will, in verse 64 again. John chapter 6 and verse 64. But there be some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not. And then look, if you will, again in 70 and 71. Jesus answered, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a demon, a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, Judas was a thief. He betrayed the Lord Jesus. He sold Jesus for thirty pieces of silver. Sin had deceived Judas after he realized what he had done. After he realized how deceived he had been by sin, the Bible says that he went to the chief priest and the elders and gave them this 30 pieces of silver back. And he said, I have betrayed innocent blood. The deed that he'd done 
hangs over his mind like a veil of death. It gnaws away at his conscience. It brings him to despair. Sin deceived him. Sin promised much. It paid little. Former pastor of this church, Dr. R.G. Lee, used to say, you can eat the devil's corn if you want to, but he'll, he'll choke you on the cob. That's what happened to, to Judas. The bread of deceit is sweet, but afterward a man's mouth shall be filled with gravel. His sin deceived him, and sin will deceive you, friend. But God gave you a choice. God gave you a choice. God gave me a choice. God gave you a choice. God gave Judas a choice. God knew what choice he would make, but nonetheless he had a choice, and he blew it. He died and went to hell. He went to his own place. Sin deceived him. Sin destroyed him. Sin damned him. And one last thing I want us to see in the few minutes we have. I want us to see not only the, the, the tragedy of sin, but I want us to see the security of the believer. You know, every now and then somebody will say, you know, Pastor Rogers, I, one of the reasons I can't believe in eternal security is because of Judas. Judas. Judas lost his salvation. Have you been listening, folks? Judas never had any salvation. Judas never was saved. Uh, the Bible says in verse 64, Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not. Now, there's a great difference that day between Judas and Simon Peter. Look down in verse 67 in and Jesus said unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Now watch this. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Two categories there that day. Judas, outwardly religious, but had never had a new birth, but never been born again. And, and Simon Peter, rough, stumbling, but he was there, and God kept him. Look, if you will, go back and look in verse 37. Chapter 6, verse 37. Watch this. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Now watch this. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Isn't that great? That's a good place for an amen. All right, now look in verse 47, if you will. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me. Now remember, Judas didn't believe. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread that cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Why do I believe in eternal security? Because again, in John chapter 10, just a few verses later, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. What was the difference between Judas and Peter? If you read when you get home, Luke chapter 22, you're going to find out in that chapter that Jesus said, one's going to betray me and one's going to deny me. Judas betrayed Jesus and went to hell. Peter denied Jesus and he's in heaven. What was the difference? Jesus said of Judas, it had been good for that man, he'd never been born. Now listen, if you don't get born twice, you're going to rue the day you were ever born at all. Been good for that man, he'd never been born. The Bible says he died and went to his own place, but what about, what about uh, Peter? <laughs> Jesus said, Peter, Satan has desired you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. Isn't that great? Did Jesus ever pray a prayer that wasn't answered? Of course not. He said, Father, I thank you, you always hear me. Uh, you see, the soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will never, no, never desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. You and I, had we been there, we would have said, Oh, Peter, uh, he's lost. But you know, 
Peter loved Jesus. Amen. Weak, stumbling, but he said, we believe and are sure that you're the Christ. Do you believe that? Now, let me tell you something, folks. You need to put your faith where God has put your sins, right on Jesus. <laughs> right on Jesus. Clearly, plainly, wonderfully, simply, gloriously, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. 